¿Qué sería de mí si no me hubieras alcanzado? ¿Dónde estaría hoy si no me hubieras perdonado? Tendría un vacío en mi corazón, vagaría sin rumbo, sin dirección. Si no fuera por tu gracia y por tu amor. Hallelujah. Only the Holy Spirit light up your lamp. And now I'm bringing you to a higher level where you will begin to understand that there can be counterfeit lamps. The book of Psalms 119 verse 105 will help us understand this. The lamp is supposed to guide you and help you and also to reflect the life of Christ that is in you. What is that lamp? Psalm 119 verse 5. It says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. So you surely see that when all the virgins stepped out to go wait on the Lord, the lamp was essentially supposed to give them light so they don't stumble and knock the rocks, hit their feet on the rocks, so they may walk the walk in the right way even as ordained by the Lord in this calling. It's very important to understand that the lamp would also lead them into living the word of the Lord. So, the light of the Lord that the wise virgins had emanated from the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, let me bring you to another level. The lamp that the foolish virgins had emanated from the word of the Lord. You see that? But the only difference is that the wise virgins fulfilled Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7. That's the only difference between the two. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7. And he says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. So you can see what the foolish virgins did. They were called foolish because they despised the wisdom and the discipline that is instituted and ordained by the word. So if you were to redefine the wise virgins, that was the church, the remnant church, that lived under the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of all wisdom. No wonder they were called wise. Essentially, that means the lamp that we're carrying was emitting out the fear of the Lord. Hallelujah. And their lives were characterized by the fear of the Lord. Somebody, are you getting this deeper and deeper and deeper? And you see that the lamps are our lives that were created by God, okay? And the lamps in our lives are created by God and originally intended to be lit by the Holy Spirit. And the flame it gives is the light. Hallelujah. And it's also the fruit of the Spirit. Because you see that when the wise virgins were able to pour the external oil, that is the Holy Spirit, they increased in filling, they were able to give more of the fruit of the Spirit. Hallelujah. In the book of Galatians, chapter 5, Verses 23, you see the fruit that the lamp is supposed to have emitted. Chapter 5, verses 20 to 23. You see that which the foolish virgins did not emit. The fruit of the Spirit they did not emit. Let's look at the fruit of the Spirit that the lamp was supposed to emit even as the virgins were walking in the darkness presenting the image of Christ, the five wise virgins. Verses 20 and 23, this is what he says. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Listen to that somebody. Do you remember the Holy Communion? Being faithful unto the Lord, waiting on Him. Gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the sinful nature with His passions and desires. So surely it's very clear from here that there is a lot that is supposed to have been emitted by the five foolish virgins, but they did not. And yet, the lamp of the five wise virgins was able to emit the fruit of the Spirit because of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And the gifts that would help the church to grow to full stature. We can look at the virgins. There's something very interesting in this parable. In this parable, the Lord Jesus presented ten virgins Five of them were wise, 
while five were foolish. And you see very clearly that they are a group. They are five, the foolish and the wise. Of course, that talks about the 50% of the remnant that he passes through the fire of the Holy Spirit. Which remnant that Zechariah was speaking about in Zechariah 13? The remnant that will enter. Now listen to something else here. There was a covenant between the virgins. All of them were virgins. You see that? They were undefiled. There was a company covenant they had together. They were behaving together as a company. All were virgins. Hallelujah. And all of them set out to wait on the Lord. So that was a covenant they had. All of them were aware that Jesus was coming. The bridegroom was coming. Hallelujah. What is the message the Lord was speaking in this parable when he had them operate in a covenant, in a peer group covenant, peer covenant, in a group covenant, a company covenant, as a company? In other words, the Lord is emphasizing that the Holy Spirit is the final authority that prepares the church. So she can be a radiant, holy bride unto the Lord. But he was also talking about the perilous times, the difficult times that will come at the end time. And when he said the five virgins would separate out from the other five and enter, refuse to share their oil with them, he essentially meant the different cadres and different levels of separation that the perfect bride of Christ would have to go through. I don't know how about you listening today. Maybe you are in a very inclusive church. You want to include the homosexuals. You want to include the gays, the immorals, the everybody, inclusive church. Today there is a lot of talk about inclusiveness, which has even entered the church. But what is the first separation? The first separation that the Lord was talking about here is to become a Christian, to separate from the secular world. Hallelujah. The second separation is to separate out from the general Christian. There are different types of religions within the Christian faith, so-called Christian faith. To be in the Pentecostal, Holy Ghost believing, Bible teaching church. Many churches don't teach about the Holy Spirit. You see the next level of separation? The third level of separation is when he told them, separate out as a remnant from the church, the few that went to the streets, you remember that? As a remnant, having been aware that times have changed, and the wedding of the Lamb of God is near. Separate out completely. If your eye causes you to sin, gorge it out so you may enter heaven even with one eye than to enter hell with both eyes. That eye may be your mother, your father. I don't know what that eye is. Your car, your home, your job. And that's why he says, only those that have separated out from their mother and father will be able to cling, unite with Christ and be one flesh with him. Flesh of my flesh and bone of my bones. Hallelujah. That's another level of separation. Stepping out now from the walls into the world, reaching them with the love of Christ, evangelizing even as Daniel chapter 12 verse 3 has said, they will shine like the brightness of the stars forever and ever. Those who bring more into the righteousness of the Lord. The next level of separation, of course, is family, which we have talked about. The next level of separation among those that have been enlightened and stepped out, waiting on the Lord, separate from them. That's what the Lord is emphasizing here, precious people. So you see that there is a company of five that have separated out completely. And so the Lord was emphasizing the importance of separation, what we call group consecration. This was group consecration that would have to take place in the last days within the unity of faith. Now, do you understand why he defined the perfect bride in the context of the unity of faith? Which means we have the common belief. We know that he is holy. He is coming for a holy bride. There is no compromise to sin. He is absolutely glorious. And that is the unity of faith. It did not mean combine a few religions and churches. He did not bring religion here. And he said there would be power in corporate in the assembly, in fellowshipping together those that are finally separated out and they are waiting on the Lord. That's why you see there are five. Hallelujah. And they are waiting together. And he said this was a very important experience that is going to come in the last days. Because the enemy will be also out. He will be outrageous. He will be enraged. He will be ferocious. 
there will be the devouring. But he said, there is need for them to be together. Do you remember the time of Nehemiah? When Nehemiah was building the wall that was broken around Jerusalem. And he told them, when you hear the trumpet, join us there for the Lord of heaven will fight for us. You see that? So the Lord was speaking about the unique unity that would emerge among the Christians, the few now, the remnant bride, that has chosen to follow the holiness of the Lord, even sensitive of the fact that the rapture can happen at any time. There will be need for them to fellowship together in the unity of faith. That's what he meant when he said the United Church. He didn't mean combine a few religions with different names, a few ministries registered with different names. He meant one belief, knowing that Christ is coming, time is out, He's holy, He's glorious, no compromise to sin. Hallelujah. And you see very clearly in 2 Timothy chapter 3, there is a crisis that will come in the last days. People will be lovers of money, lovers of pleasure, boastful, lovers of themselves. And that's why these are the perilous times, the difficult times he defined, which would cause the need for the little remnant of the remnant coalesce together, to fellowship together as they wait on the Lord. That's why there was a group and company covenant among the five. Hallelujah. I want to read the book of Micah, chapter 2, verses 12 to 13, as why the Lord spoke about this company and the prophecy he gave even about this company that would come together during the dark times. I'm now introducing the fact of the dark times. I'm starting to talk about the dark times. And he says in Micah, chapter 2, verses 12 to 13, he says, I will surely gather all of you, O Jacob, I will surely bring together the remnant of Israel. I will bring them together like sheep in a pen, like a flock in its pasture. The place will throng with people. One who breaks open the way will go up before them, and they will break through the gate and go out. The king will pass through before them, and the Lord at their head. So you see very clearly that this was a prophecy the Lord was speaking to Israel, but has a direct bearing to the church. And again, I told you, there is nothing he ever spoke to Israel that he did not speak to the church of Christ. There would be need during the dark times now for the church to be together. It's called corporate congregation. And the lamps of the virgins as they enter into the banquet, these lamps that they carry, the wise virgins, continue lighting even inside the banquet. I'm now bringing you to another level again. As the wise virgins prepared for the difficult dark times that were coming in the last days, the Lord was speaking to the church that the dark times would come, so you would need to be equipped in the Holy Spirit, with the infilling of the Holy Spirit, and very much aware that the amount of infilling and preparation you've had through the Holy Spirit, the cleansing, the cleaning, and all these things we've talked about preparing the bride of Christ, would have an eternal implication because the bride of Christ, the five wise virgins, were able to enter with the same lamps into the banquet. Hallelujah. And that's what Daniel saw essentially. No wonder if you look at the Bible in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verses 7 to 9, he talks about heaven rejoicing for the wedding of the Lamb has come and the bride of Christ has made herself ready. And if you look very carefully there, you see that fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear, and she's now wearing it. And fine linen is the righteousness and the holiness of the remnant church. But look at this now. When you look at Revelation 19, verses 11 to 21, the army that Jesus is coming with during the day of the Lord, seven years after the rapture, they are also wearing fine linen, bright and clean. And that tells us that the Lord was speaking to the church and saying, the preparations that you do here on earth have an eternal implication into the way you fellowship with the Lord. No wonder the wise virgins, by carrying the oil and being cleansed by the infilling of the Holy Spirit to be radiant, were able to enter with the same lamps into the wedding banquet, hallelujah, into eternity. And I'm bringing you to a very critical concept, even how the Lord spoke through Israel to the church. You see very, very clearly here that even the fine linen, bright and clean, you prepare today for the wedding, is the same fine linen, bright and clean, that you'll come back with 
on the day of the Lord. And that happens seven years after the rapture. Hallelujah. So we see very clearly here that the wise virgins were infilled with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is able to keep an abiding, non-ending love burning in their hearts, the flame you're seeing, which love focused them on Christ. And that's why it was burning and they were focused more on the banquet than the things of the world. And that light entered with them into eternity. They entered into the wedding of the Lamb with that lamp. They were faithful. They kept their eyes in the things of God. And the fact that they are wise means they had the fear of the Lord in the main fabric of their being. And so in the book of Second Corinthians chapter 11 verse 2, he says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promise you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. You see how important that is. The Holy Spirit, again I repeat here, was able to infill the wise virgins. And that's the message the Lord is giving the church. That when you become a vessel available to the Holy Spirit, He will infill you as a remnant bride of Christ. And He will create in you an abiding, non-ending love that will burn in your heart for Christ the bridegroom. Now, that abiding love will focus you on the wedding of the Lamb. It will remind you of the Holy Communion, the Last Supper, which was actually a pre-wedding covenant of faithfulness, that you may not go to any other man but wait on Christ, the chief bridegroom, Christ the Messiah. And he says here very clearly that he is jealous of his bride. Hallelujah. That is looking for one that has not run around. He is jealous with the godly jealousy towards her, so she may be a pure virgin. Look at the words he uses there. Pure, undefiled, holy, virgin, undefiled, untouched. So surely the Holy Spirit was so important, and he remains very important in this message here, and very central, because only the Holy Spirit can create that abiding, non-ending, burning love in the heart of the Bride of Christ, so she may focus strictly and solo on him and on the wedding of the Lamb. And I think that's a very, very mighty, mighty thing the Holy Spirit is doing. So he may be able to present her as a pure virgin. Look at the words he uses. Undefiled. No wonder the five wise virgins were able to make it. Because they have the Holy Spirit always purifying them, creating the fire that brought the flame. That fire is essentially the non-ending, hallelujah, abiding, non-ending Love that was burning in their hearts for Christ. Which was absolutely absent among the five foolish virgins. And then it is also important to realize that he was talking about the end time. He was saying that that was so important that the Holy Spirit be available to keep that fire burning. Because there would be strong winds in the last hour that would try to extinguish that burning love for Christ. Hallelujah. And this was prophesied. This was prophesied in several books in the Bible. In Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1. Hallelujah. There was a prophecy about the dark times. Isaiah 60, verse 1 to 4. He says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and His glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from far. Your daughters are carried on the arm. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy, and the wealth of the seas will be brought to you. And to you the riches of the nations will come. So this essentially was a prophecy. He talked about the dark times. In fact, he was talking about the glory that would visit Zion visit Israel after the dark periods. You see that? But in the same scripture, you see that he spoke very clearly about the dark times that will come into the church before the glory of the Lord will come in the rapture of the church. No wonder he was talking about the great need for the Holy Spirit to come and fill them and focus them, keep their hearts throbbing with great love for the Lord. 
Hallelujah. The same prophecy was given in the book of Genesis chapter 15 when the father spoke to Abraham and he spoke to Abraham about the great need for corporate congregation. When he asked Abraham to look up in the sky and look at how many stars you can see, if you can count them as numerous as they are, will be the nations that will come out of you. Listen to me somebody. The Lord was essentially talking about corporate shining. The bearers of the light of Christ would shine together. That's why the five virgins are five, somebody. Hallelujah. So they can be able to bear the light of Christ together. The light bearers shine in a company. The same thing in Revelation chapter 7. There is the glorious congregation of the redeemed. Hallelujah. But now, I want to talk about the darkness that the Lord causes the remnant to coalesce, to assemble together, to stick together out of the fear of. Again, the Lord talks about the five virgins in a corporate, in a company covenant together to encourage each other as they wait on the Lord together with their lamps. And that is because he saw that in the last days, at the last moment, there will be a tremendous darkness that will come in the church. And all of you are now familiar with the great darkness that has come into the church. We have seen in the church the great philosophy that has penetrated the church. We've seen also the false gospels, like the gospel that's very horizontal, the gospel of compromise that has entered the church, where gays and homosexuals are accepted. They can preach in the church while remaining gay. That is the darkness the Lord was prophesying here, somebody. That's the darkness for which he wanted the few who have set out to become the perfect bride of Christ, to stick together in fellowship, in one faith, to stay together, encourage each other, as they are able to overcome the darkness. Hallelujah. We have seen the gospel of prosperity that preaches the things of the world. We have seen the many things that have infiltrated. In fact, there is gross darkness right now in these last days in the church. But let us see how the Lord prophesied them and what he talked about. And essentially, it is what is called apostasy. The apostasy of faith. The falling away from the true faith in Christ. Let's look at the apostasy as it was prophesied. We know that apostasy is the falling away from true faith in Christ Jesus. And when the Lord gave the parable of the five wise virgins and the five foolish virgins, he essentially spoke about the apostasy of the faith that would come in the last moments. Hallelujah. The falling away from true faith even within the remnant church. The remnant that has stepped out awaiting the coming of the Lord. He essentially said there would be apostasy. That's why you see that the five foolish virgins fell away and they were able to go into the tribulation. In other words, he's telling the church that out of you will come a small remnant that will seek after my own heart, but half of that remnant will fall away. But let me bring you back to another big thing here. Do you remember when Moses was sent by the Lord to redeem Israel from slavery? That was essentially a prophecy that the Lord was speaking of what Christ would come and do with the church, redeeming her from spiritual Egypt. Hallelujah. And again, I'm talking about the prophecy of the apostasy that is embedded in that scripture. You see that when Jesus came, he died on the cross, redeeming us from the filth and the death that Adam had drawn us into when Adam fell. So when Moses goes to Egypt, he redeems Israel from Egypt so she can finally be set free, go into the wilderness to worship God, wilderness of repentance towards the promised land, which is the rapture for the church. But in the wilderness, there was a lot of falling somebody. You saw many of them made a calf. They worshipped a calf. That was apostasy taking place there. Even speaking the apostasy of the faith from true worship of Christ that would happen to the church. They were worshipping a calf. They did many things. They were longing to go back to Egypt. And the Lord killed a lot of them. They died in the wilderness. That was the first level of the apostasy that the Lord was speaking that would happen to the church. Let me bring you to the next level of the apostasy. When the Lord brought Moses and they reached close to the land of Israel, he brought him onto the mountain and he showed him the land and said, look, that's the land that I promised these people. But he said, these people you see, as they get now to go to that land, 
they will fall away. And when they fall away from me, on that day I'll turn my face away from them. Only a remnant will be able to stand with true faith. Now what does that mean to the church? How does that speak to the five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins and the message that the Lord Jesus was speaking to this church? Now the first level of the apostasy is the fall that you have seen in the church. Darkness, homosexuals, gospel of prosperity, the philosophies and different doctrines that don't stand up to holiness, the teaching that is short of the teaching of the Holy Spirit in the church. But look at the next level. When finally Moses is standing on the hill and he has seen Israel, the promise where they are going to, that represents the revelation that the ten virgins received, that look, the bridegroom is now coming. They can now see the land of the rapture. But even there, there is apostasy. The five foolish virgins will not enter. So there were different levels. And that was spoken already in the Bible through prophecy. You see it in Second Timothy chapter 3. Now, I want to look at Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 15 and 19, and you see how Moses spoke a prophecy to the church, even through the five foolish virgins and the wise virgins. Again, Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 15, all the way down somebody. He says, Then the Lord appeared in the tent in a pillar of cloud, and the cloud stood at the entrance of the tent. And the Lord said to Moses, you are going to rest with your fathers, and these people will soon prostitute themselves with the foreign gods of the land they are entering. Hallelujah. They will forsake me and break the covenant I made with them, and on that day I will become angry with them and forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they will be destroyed, and many disasters and difficulties will come upon them. And on that day they will ask, Have not these disasters come upon us because our God is not with us? And I'll suddenly hide my face on that day because of the wickedness by turning away to other gods. This is a covenant people, Israel. A people that know the basics of the Lord. They know the covenant they have with the Lord with Jacob. Hallelujah. And the Lord saw that as they were going to approach the land of milk and honey, they were going to fall away. That's the apostasy that I'm talking about. And that's the prophecy that Moses was speaking to the five foolish virgins. That they would fall away even as they have seen where they are heading to. Even after seeing the land of milk and honey, even after seeing the rapture near here, knowing that he's coming, stepping out to wait on him with lamps, they would fall away. What a tremendous situation. And then the book of Deuteronomy chapter 32, the song of Moses. I'll just read two verses of the prophecy that Moses spoke to the church, even speaking to the five foolish virgins. Let's read verse 5 and verse 16. Verse 5 says, And they have acted corruptly towards him. To their shame, they are no longer his children, but a warped up and crooked generation. Verse 16 says, They made him jealous with their foreign gods, and they angered him with their detestable idols. That is essentially what the foolish virgins did in the dying moments when they can see the land of milk and honey right ahead of them. They were not able to honor God with their bodies, to honor God with their walk, with their lives. If they had honored God, they would have walked in the fear of the Lord, somebody. A trait that we see with the wise virgins. Let us move on, precious people. There was still a lot of prophecy that was spoken towards this apostasy. Jesus himself spoke in John chapter 5, verse 43, and he was talking to the church even about the apostasy that would hit the church. He said, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. This was directed to the foolish virgins, to the church that fails to enter. Hallelujah. And this church, even with the knowledge of Christ, was not able to live according to this word, that cleans with water and being filled with the Holy Spirit. They were not available to Christ. And yet, the church that made the perfect bride was able to live in the fear of the Lord, in the Word, and so they could enter the rapture. ¿Qué sería de mí si no me hubieras alcanzado? ¿Dónde estaría hoy si no me hubieras perdonado? Tendría un vacío en mi corazón 
Vagaría sin rumbo, sin dirección Si no fuera por tu gracia y por tu amor Si no fuera por tu gracia y por 